Good morning, Trace Church. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm Dr. T, teaching pastor here at Trace. If you're a regular attender, welcome back. It is so good to have you with us this morning. If you are new at Trace, we are so glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, We want you to feel welcome, and we hope the Lord speaks to you today. I just want to say I could not be more excited about what the future of Trace Church looks like. Can we give it up for what God has placed on the hearts of our pastor and our staff? One church, soon to be two locations. Shortly thereafter, back to one church. This is an awesome time uh, in the history of Trace Church. Really, really honored to get to be a part of it. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, one, achieving unity in divided age. So I'm going to continue our sermon series called One, and I want to talk specifically about unity. In 2019, On the 31st of August, something extraordinary happened. It was 6.30 in the evening, and the LSU football team takes the field at Tigers Stadium. (laughs) Uh, And um, they uh, faced Georgia Southern and shellacked them 55 to three. And that began what turns out to have been the most incredible the most historic, the most memorable NCAA football season in the history of the National Football, the NCAA Football League. All right, I'm being a little facetious there, but I am a huge Tigers fan. And after uh, they beat Clemson in the national championship, 42 to 25 later that year in the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana, every reporter and every newscaster was interested in one thing, What was it about the 2019 Tigers football team that made it so incredible? And there are a couple of easy ways to answer that question, right? Like the team was really stacked with talent. 14 players were drafted that year in the NFL draft. Five went in the first round. A lot of the coaches and and the coordinators and the staff went on to do bigger and better things, to coach in head coaching positions in NCAA, uh, for NCAA football teams, or in some coordinator role for the NFL. Like they were stacked with talent, they had great coaching, but none of those things was the thing that made this team special. If you would, if you would listen to the uh, news reports and read what was written about this uh, team, you would see that every player and every coach consistently identified a theme that made this group stand out. And it was unity. It was unity. The slogan for the Tigers this year was one team, one heartbeat. And Coach Ed Ogeron would say later that his goal was to take all the awesome talent and all the excellent coaching and unify those things in a way that made this team extraordinary. And he did, and we know today that LSU is the best football team in the NCAA. (laughs) So years and years ago, years and years ago, there was a small church with big potential located in a town called Ephesus. And there was a missionary who started the church that really saw championship caliber talent in the church. And so I wanna give you a little bit of the backstory. The guy who ultimately uh, developed the church in Ephesus was the Apostle Paul. And so that story is found in the book of Acts and the Apostle Paul leaves a town called Corinth and he travels to Ephesus. And when he gets to Ephesus, he meets a group of disciples. And he talks to these disciples and he and the disciples decide we're gonna go to the synagogue and we're gonna teach people about Jesus. And a synagogue would be like a Jewish house of worship. And so he goes to the synagogue and for a few months he is teaching people the gospel message about Jesus Christ being the Messiah, about his death, burial and resurrection and about his love for the entire world. And the the Jews in the synagogue in Ephesus were obstinate and they didn't believe the message that Paul was teaching them. And I cannot preach a sermon on this, even though every ministry fiber in my body desperately wants to, but Paul and the disciples have to get out of their sort of safe religious bubble 
they leave the synagogue and they go teach every day in Ephesus in a place called the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus. And as I was thinking about that, I was reminded, that's kind of what Trace Church is doing with our new location at Trace Chapel Hills, man. We're sort of broadening our horizon, getting a little bit outside of our religious sort of familiarity and comfort level and going to evangelize a world that desperately needs the good news of Jesus Christ. So Ephesus was like a major uh, uh, point of trade and commerce and lots of people traveled in and out of Ephesus on a consistent basis. And as Paul was teaching in the hall of Tyrannus, the scriptures record that he actually evangelized all of Asia. Now what most scholars think is that the hall of Tyrannus was at least a few hundred and likely many thousands of seats large. It was a huge space. And it was a space that lots of people would have come to listen to teaching. And God was on the move powerfully in Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So that's the first really important feature of what was happening at Ephesus. This is in Acts chapter 19, but God was on the move. Starting in verse 11, uh, the story goes, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. So I was thinking about this and I thought, you know what? That's the Ephesus healing hanky, right? That's what this verse uh, symbolizes. We don't have a healing hanky at Trace, but we do have the transformation towel, right? Uh, And the transformation towel, all right, if you rub it on Pastor Aaron, it's just gonna smell a little bit funky, But if you come pick up a transformation towel at Trace Church, it symbolizes the miracle, Trace, the miracle that God is doing in the lives of someone at Trace Church 2,000 years after God is doing miracles in Ephesus through the ministry of Paul. That's awesome to get to be a part of. That's awesome. So Paul has this really powerful ministry in Ephesus and the culture in Ephesus is like really, really crazy. Like the culture in Colorado Springs in 2022. So Ephesus was the location of one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was called the Temple of Artemis. And so Artemis was a Greek goddess of fertility and hunting and it's really a weird uh, symbol uh, in history. But one of the features of the Ephesian economy was there was a lot of craftsmen who were selling memorabilia uh, of Artemis, right? And so they made a great living selling uh, things that reminded people who traveled through Ephesus of Artemis. And Paul was teaching that there is only one God and that God has a son named Jesus and there are no other gods other than that one God. So Artemis was no God at all. And as you can imagine, this was not great for the economy of artisans and craftspeople in Ephesus. So they end up starting a riot, and that verse was on the screen just a little bit ago, and the rallying cry of the rioters was, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And that really stirred up the people in Ephesus, and eventually Paul thought, you know what, my season of ministry here has ended. He'd been there for a couple of years, taught every day in the hall of Tyrannus, and he leaves. Eventually, God uh, tells Paul that he needs to head to Jerusalem. And so Paul, on his way back to Jerusalem, wants to say goodbye to his dear friends in Ephesus. He doesn't want to go back to Ephesus because he doesn't want to incite another riot. So he sends for them and they meet him. And we get some clarity that Ephesus was a pretty new church plant, a lot like Trace. So he has this meeting And he's talking to the elders and he says, remember for three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. So at the point in time, this is recorded by Luke, uh, the, the church in Ephesus had been around for about three years. And Paul tells these guys that he loves them and that they will always be in his prayers and he is thankful for them. 
And then he reminds them that your church in Ephesus would face some challenging seasons. And so before he leaves, he tells his dear friends, the elders in Ephesus, even from your own number, some men will arise. They will distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Now think about this for just a second, Trace Church. There was a lot of messed up stuff in the culture in Ephesus at this time. Like Paul could have warned them, hey, if you get too outspoken about the truth of the message of Jesus, they're gonna riot again. Or if you're not really careful, uh, some people could try to uh, throw you in prison or uh, stone you or hurt you in some way. Maybe, you, maybe you're gonna lose your death. There's a lot he could have warned them about that would legitimately have been a challenge they would have faced in the future. And in, in the last conversation he has with these guys, he says, I wanna warn you of one thing and remind you of one thing, the importance of unity, the importance of unity. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but I would love for you at some point this week to read from Acts 20 to the end of the book of Acts and just hear how the latter part of the Apostle Paul's life plays out. Awesome, awesome story uh, that really gives God glory and really clarifies uh, what, what our call is in ministry as a people of God. We don't have time for that. But eventually, to summarize, Paul gets put in prison and in prison he thinks about the church he loves in Ephesus, little church with big potential and championship talent. And he decides to write them a letter that they could use to like teach and admonish each other and that would provide some guidance and circulate around that region with other disciples. And in the letter, Paul shares with his dear friends in Ephesus three key components for keeping and maintaining unity in a divided age. So I wanna share that with you this morning. The first thing that Paul teaches the church in Ephesus about unity, and this is found in Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse two. The first thing he teaches them about unity, about how to find and keep and maintain unity in a divided age is to love each other, is to love each other. So in the fourth chapter of the letter he wrote, here's what he says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. All right, if you're taking notes, there's a couple of things I want you to write down this morning that are really important about the idea of love as it relates to being unified in a divided age. First thing, if you were to take the, uh, the phrase being completely humble, and add it in like an equation to being gentle and add that with being patient and add that with love. If you added complete humility with gentleness, patience, and love, you would get what modern uh, uh, relationship experts call empathy. Empathy is being completely humble, gentle, patient, and loving. Colloquially, we talk about empathy like this, uh, walking a mile in someone else's shoes. That's what we're referring to. We also say seeing the world through someone else's eyes. And in the literature on relationships, when we're talking about empathy, here's the definition. It is one person's ability to get authentically in touch with another person's inner world. Empathy is one person's ability to get authentically in touch with another person's inner world. How do you do that? Paul just told us. Be completely humble, be gentle, and give it time. Be patient. The best example in the history of humankind for an, a capacity for empathy is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He humbled himself and left the halls of heaven and, and took upon himself the form of a servant. Trace, that means Jesus got to our level. He was tempted in all ways, just like you and I are. 
Jesus knows what it feels like to be you. When you feel like no one else knows what it's like to be you, Jesus does. He does, he knows. And if you take the time to get authentically in touch with the inner world of another person, to get to their level, it is really, really hard to be divided. Psychologists talk about this using a phrase called theory of mind. I'm going as fast as I can. I got a lot to cover. I told Aaron, I keep the announcement short, man. This is, I'm gonna be long-winded today. Psychologists call this theory of mind. Let me explain that to you. It just means your ability to surmise what another person is thinking or feeling. This happens to you in life. Uh, you have close friends that you've been friends with for over a decade and you know them so well, you can tell what they're thinking and you can really accurately guess what they're feeling. Now, psychologists call it a theory of mind because you can't actually know what someone's mindset really is. But if you demonstrate empathy towards someone for long enough, completely humble, gentle, patient, and loving, pretty soon you get deeply attuned to that person and can guess what they're thinking and feeling. A really good way to do that a really good way to do that is to constantly ask yourself a question. When I was training as a counselor early on in my education, I had a professor that said, best way to get in touch with the client's inner world, constantly ask yourself the question, what makes this make sense? What makes this make sense? Most behavior and thought and feeling makes sense when you really understand someone's inner world. Now, there are definitely outliers, those people are, are, are a little bit strange, to put it mildly, right? But as a rule, most behavior, most thinking, and most feeling makes sense given context. So how do you figure out what the context is? You ask yourself that question. What makes this make sense? So when someone is being very kind and compassionate and tenderhearted to you, ask yourself that question. What makes that make sense about this person? And the opposite of that coin is also true when someone is very harsh and very critical or even very threatening. Ask yourself the same question. What makes this make sense? It'll help you get a little bit more in touch with the other person's inner world and it will keep you on the path Paul demands here towards unity. Second thing Paul describes that's critical to unity, second key unity component is peace. Peace. So the very next verse, Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Have you ever wondered what it is really that connects Christian people together? The first thing that might come to mind is like, well, it's agreement, right? We all agree that Jesus Christ is God's son. The Bible is the word of God. We all value corporate worship. Like maybe it's agreement. That's not what Paul says. Well, maybe it's that our worldview is the same, that we all tend to have the same outlook on humanity and the meaning of life and the nature of, of suffering. That's not it either. It's peace. The bond of peace is the mechanism of unity between God's people. So if you're, if you're considering that for a moment, let's just take a second to then define peace. Peace is a person's capacity to maintain an inner state of tranquility regardless of what's happening in the world around them. That's peace. A person's ability to maintain an inner state of tranquility regardless of what's happening in the world around them. Peaceful people, in other words, Trace Church, are people whose inner world is not very influenced by the world around them. Two thoughts about this. First, you cannot have peace in life this side of heaven if you have not made peace with God. But when you have made peace with God, you get the peace of God. And here's what influence the peace of God has on Christian people. And you can probably imagine more these are basically what Paul talks through in the letter he writes to Ephesus. The first difference is that your sins are forgiven and you get a brand new start in life. You are brought literally from darkness to light. 
That's wonderful. The second thing that happens is you become a citizen of a brand new kingdom. I was on a missions trip once to Nicaragua and really and visiting a really impoverished area. And I was sad for the people that I was doing ministry with, but I wasn't sad for me because I wasn't a citizen of that country. I was a citizen of a country that I knew certain things about that protected my inner well-being no matter what I was experiencing in the world outside me. And the third piece, our sins are forgiven. We become citizens of another kingdom. The third piece is that we know how the story ends. We know how the story ends. So no matter what happens in life this side of heaven, we can use those three truths about peace with God that relate to our peace from God to help our inner world stay peaceful no matter how chaotic the world outside of us gets. Second, second thing about peace. If you look at the research on peace, every single study agrees on at least one point, that peace happens through conflict and struggle. Now, that's not really a fun thing to say, but every time you navigate conflict or struggle in the world you live within, you're filled with a little bit greater level of peace. Uh, there was a, a psychiatrist about 70 years ago uh, who was Jewish, and he lived in Germany, and his name was Viktor Frankl. And uh, he was captured uh, by the Nazis, and he was taken to Auschwitz prison camp. And when he was there uh, as a psychiatrist, as a physician, as a researcher, he was really uh, terrified and overwhelmed and sad but he decided that to give his life some sense of purpose, he would try to figure out how the people who seemed to be surviving were able to survive. And this is essentially what he was saying. He said, the people that were able to survive were people who somehow were able to separate their inner world from their external world. And every time they survived a beating or some other form of abuse or some really just uh, excruciatingly agonizing moment. Every time that happened, if that person's way of thinking was that nothing anybody can do to me can change my inner world without me allowing, then I always possess that freedom and that can never be taken away. And that was the difference that made a difference for people who survived. And that's a necessary feature of our Christian walk. Now, there are some seasons where that's just not possible for Trent. I can't say for you. But I think what I'm trying to do in my life and in my relationships is cultivate that inner sense of peace that's not tethered to my external world. And I hope you'll do the same. As we do, the stuff on the outside doesn't prompt the disunity it otherwise would. Next thing Paul says is, is centeredness is a key component for maintaining unity in divided age. So he picks up by saying, there is one body, church in Ephesus, Trace Church. There's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, here's the truth. It does take some effort to be unified. It takes a little bit of emotional energy. So the healthier you are, the better your well-being, the more energy you have, the easier it is for you to stay unified. And a lot of people in my uh, uh, life have, have spoken into me or I've read a lot about what well-being in life is all about. There are kind of two schools of thought as it, as it has played out historically. The first is this idea of subjective well-being, subjective well-being. And subjective well-being is basically a person's self-report of the difference between the amount of pain and the amount of pleasure in, life, in their life. And so to the degree that that is an imbalance towards pleasure, people report high levels of subjective well-being, right? The more pleasure in life, the less pain, the more I feel healthy and whole. Eventually, researchers decided that was inadequate, so they developed a concept of psychological well-being. 
Psychological well-being is basically just the idea that my inner goals align with what I'm accomplishing in my external world. But then that also felt inadequate. So researchers are now talking about this idea of centeredness theory, centeredness theory. And what that basically means is that we have the most important domains of our life aligned around a meaningful, unshakable center. Seriously, this is secular research. This is exactly what the scriptures and Paul particularly here are teaching us. Trace, we have got to stay centered around the main things. I put a graph together here for you based on what Paul says uh, to the Ephesians. He's like, look, here, here is all the important stuff that we should all align around a common center that is unshakable, that is eternal, that is unchanging, and that if you orient your life around will never lead you astray and will instead lead you in unity with other people who are focused around that same central piece. And for those of us who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the cross of Christ. As Jesus was finishing up his earthly ministry, he takes a moment to pray over his disciples. And I think about these kind of moments, you know, Paul in prison gets the shot to write one letter to the church in Ephesus. What's he gonna write? Jesus takes a moment with his disciples right before he goes to the garden and is betrayed and then brutalized and crucified and he prays. And aside from like the prayer in Gethsemane, uh, this is the last one that he prays over his followers for us to read, to listen to, to hear. What is it that he prays about? What's on Jesus's mind and heart? He's got this moment, one shot, What's on his heart? And it's unity, Trace Church. It's being unified no matter how divided the age in which you live becomes. In John 17, here's what he says. My prayer is not just for my disciples alone, but I also wanna pray for Trace Church. Because in 2022, I'm gonna just bestow some major blessings on trace and they're gonna grow and be a church not in the community, but of and for the community. Lives are gonna be changed, marked by the trace transformation towel. And man, those, no transition comes without bumps and uncertainties. So I wanna pray that they will be one, one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world, so that Colorado Springs may believe that you have sent me. I uh, was called earlier this week by a missions organization in uh, uh, Colorado Springs. And they were like, Dr. T, we have some missionaries coming back to uh, our agency who have been in Ukraine. And we are looking for somebody to provide them with some crisis debrief counseling. Would you be willing to come and just speak into these uh, missionaries? And, and man, there, there are just some things in life that no matter what, you feel really unequipped and inadequate to handle. So I was asked and I stuttered over my words a little bit and I was like, you know, I would be honored. I would love to. And so I get in a room with these uh, individuals who decided like, should it cost them their lives? They're gonna go teach people about Jesus. And man, I walked in and just felt humbled and incompetent and uncertain. And we just had a chat, you know, we just loved on each other. And they told me two stories about what they had experienced over there that really uh, have stuck with me. So first they flew into Poland 
and they were working the border between Ukraine and Poland. And within like the first 48 hours of being on the border, there was a family of five, and I have a family of five, so this like really registered. There was a family of five who came to the border and they were handing out food and this family was just crushed. They were just weeping, inconsolable weeping. And they couldn't exactly understand what was being said, but, but they saw this scene play out and then understood the mom and the youngest two children hugged the dad and the oldest son. And the dad and the oldest son turned around and went back to fight for Ukraine. So later they go into Ukraine and they're deep into uh, Ukrainian uh, territory. And they're in a place that had experienced quite a bit of fighting. And so they see uh, uh, two people, uh, an older gentleman and, and a younger, a young man, probably late teens, and they were crying. And so this group happens upon these guys and they're like, seriously, they're using Google Translate to like talk to these two guys. And, and what they find out is that they were a family of six and their vehicle broke down about a day ago. And as they were walking to try to get to the border, a vehicle approaches them and has space for four passengers. And so the family lets four of its members travel with this other party to the border and these two are walking, trying to reunite with their family. And I was thinking, as I was thinking and praying about this lesson, you know, it just struck me that the two stories that really registered with these missionaries that also really have stuck with me were stories about division. And the truth is, Trace Church, there is so much in life this side of heaven that does divide us. There's two really good examples of that. Like nobody did anything wrong. Uh, nobody could have really made another choice. They were just separated. The families were just divided. And so in Christ Jesus, may we all make every effort to love one another with genuine empathy to maintain the bond of peace between each other and to stay focused on the one thing around which every other facet of our life should align. Let's make every effort to do that because life this side of heaven is gonna give us plenty of reasons to divide. I think if we'll take Paul up on his advice and God up on his offer, we'll be a church that stays united and we can help change the community in which we live. And I really think through Trace Church, even the world. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, come before you. God, just so thankful that in you, we really do find everything we need for our salvation, uh, for our direction, and for our connection with one another. God, my prayer over this church is Jesus's prayer over this church, that we would be united as one, like you and my Lord and Savior Jesus are one. I pray in our marriages, God, with our children and in other relationships we have in this community, that that would be our reputation. And I'm asking that we would use love and peace and centeredness 
to become those people. Thank you for Jesus. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for this church. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name.